running a, a business is not just making one decision, it's a myriad of decisions, one on top of the other. And uh, I guess it starts off, uh, what are the important early decisions that you make which set the pattern for your life? And uh, most interestingly for me, my really first big decision and big move forward took place at the age of 12. You might say, how come that? Well, it's, it's kind of simple. My parents were immigrants in South Africa, and uh, when I was born, my mother was pretty new in South Africa, and a debate took place as to what my name should be. My father suggested it should be Peter. And my mother said, no, no, my brothers will tease him because Pyotr Veliki, which uh, was Peter the Great in Russian, you see. So let's just give him a nice biblical name that he, that everybody will be comfortable with. So he went and registered me as Naftali. Everybody called me Nati, and I went to primary school, and the first day I had to bring my birth certificate with, and uh, we had to introduce ourselves to the class. So he said, what is your name? I said, my name is Nati. So I said, oh, no, 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 your name's not Nati. Your name is Nephthalia, because he had misspelt it. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, the entire <coughs> class did exactly what you've done now. <laughs> and uh, I didn't find that very funny. <laughs> but approaching high school, I was determined I was not going to high school as nap failure. That I can tell you. So at the age of 12, I did a bit of research and found out how do you change your name. I got the form, got my parents to sign it, and took it to the magistrate's court with ten and sixpence got a new abridged birth certificate, Nathan Kirsch, <laughs> which I am today. And I might just tell you that over the years, I cannot tell you how many times I've had to fill in an official form which uh, says, have you ever changed your name? <laughs> and I've never been truthful. <laughs> and that is kind of a, a lesson in life, that when you find something that is not really right or good for you, that, that you need to do something about it. I had many different businesses and they were all pretty profitable and always doing well. When I bought the big supermarket chain, it was in huge losses and it had a huge accumulated tax loss. Business was quite tough at the time and I looked at it and I said, you know, I could never access that loss for years and years and years, but if I took my other businesses and put it into that business, then the, there would be a huge positive cash flow rising out of the, sale, uh, the, the savings in tax. And in the South African tax regime, the only way I could do it was by actually selling the businesses into that entity. So that everything became under one entity as against many other entities. And that entity had a very aggressive manager who built many, many shopping centers. When this whole thing imploded, those shopping centers needed to be completed, and there, must, there were very many of them. And that resulted in us being short of money and vulnerable in the entirety instead of just being vulnerable in that one entity. And what does it teach me? That always make your decisions based on good business practice and not what's good for tax or not for anything else. <laughs> Those were the two decisions that had the greatest impact on my life. One was getting my name right and the other one was screwing up my business. <laughs> so there we go. All right, anybody ask any more questions? Hi, Nate. Uh, thanks for coming to speak to us at uh, LBS. You mentioned about, you know, fighting for what you believe is right and, uh, and you, as a result you changed your name. Could you tell us how you, uh, I mean, the film kind of suggested that you gave up, you know, your business relatively quickly, within a day. How do you balance that with what you believe? You can't just take it in isolation. You've got to take the, 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 the overall picture of what was going on in South Africa. Uh, South Africa was chaos. Uh, I had spoken to de Klerk, and who was then not the president but was the, the Minister of the Interior, a and I said to him, 
it's unsustainable. You know, this is going to land up as, in a, as a revolution. And he said, well, some things could happen, but other things would never happen. And I said to him, never is a, a very long time. And uh, when I had this fight with, with Sunlam, uh, I already had very negative views on South Africa. I, I really didn't think it was worth fighting for. And uh, I knew that I'd, I'd started a very fledgling little business in America, which was very, very tiny. But I had real negative views on the future of South Africa. It, it so happened I was wrong, because South Africa is still there, and we have a home there, uh, uh, and uh, business has thrived. Uh, and the revolution never took place. And de Klerk, I never saw for 20 years. And when I saw him after this 20-year gap, I said, so what made you change your mind? <laughs> and he said, well, he was very lucky. He said, Boerter had resigned as, as leader of the party, but not as president. And he said, uh, I became leader of the party, and I knew I was going to be president. And for six months, I had nothing to do except think, because I didn't have a job. And uh, I came to the conclusion that all the things that you said and many other people had said to me was, was correct, and that there was no future for apartheid, and that I just had to do something about it. And he said, my tough job was to sell it to my own party. And then after that, I was lucky enough to have a Mandela to work with. And so what I saw and perceived to be an extremely negative and bad outcome in point of fact had a, a, a very much more, more favorable and, and promising outcome. And South Africa is really quite a thriving economy. In fact, it's had the best currency if you uh, adjust for, for interest rates of any country in the, for the last 10 years. I think you have probably many choices where you could move, where, where it actually ended, where you could move. Why did you choose to move to America? Was that the business decision or was that uh, a personal decision on both? Well, I developed a very large cash and carry business. And in 1976, which was 10 years before I moved, I was in New York and I, just because of professional interest, went to see how the little stores in New York got their supplies. And I really thought that, that it was very rudimentary and not very efficient. So in 1976, I opened a cash and carry in New York. Uh, and it was very tough. But it was moving. And uh, 10 years later, it was still a very small business with uh, three branches or four branches. And so there was, a, a, um, there was already a, a kernel to work on. I, I, I had a somewhere to go. And uh, th it was so small that when I started up, I, I had a, a third of it. And, and the Metro company that was my own company had a third of it. And uh, company Tiger Rats had a third of it. When I went to America, uh, I bought all of them. It was tiny, but it was something to go to. Um, can I just quick reprise of my, of my question before? All right, key decisions, and what did you learn? Inflation is not going away. <laughs> <laughs> and that's perhaps uh, the one reason why I'm so focused on, on real estate, because real estate takes relatively little decisions. My advice to you is don't put your money in the bank borrow money from the bank, buy real estate, <laughs> get it properly leveraged, and sit back and watch inflation make money for you. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Tax-free. All right. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> All right. OK. You've been in real estate, in, in groceries, in food, and well, all, all these different industries. What is the, the key parameter that you, that you search in order to take the, your, your investment opportunities or, or okay. to decide to go for something? I, I think it's very important that uh, you become a leader in whatever you want to do because to just be one of the rabble and many fighting for a, a little position is not very good. So what in pretty well mo most things we do, 
try to be a leader. Secondly, go into businesses that have a recurrent income stream. A life insurance company sells you a policy and you pay on that policy for the rest of your life. So in order to get big, they just sell more and more policies and it continues and continues to grow. Open a supermarket and another supermarket, they're all recurrent income streams. The opposite is a construction company. You are a big construction company, you tender to build the Empire State Building. You're never allowed too much profit because it's all very competitive. You work five years on the project, you complete the project, and you're back where you started again. So those are the, the two extremes. The one has got no recurrent income stream. And so I try to find and only go into businesses that have recurrent income stream. In other words, to try and find things that when you build and you put a building block in place, it's in place, and then you can build another building block and another building block. Uh, I've been very fortunate in always owning, for the most part, my own businesses, and therefore I have been able to delegate to a far greater extent than if I were so running somebody else's money. So when, when you're running somebody else's money, you've got an obligation to them, so you can never delegate completely. You, you always have to be monitoring and watching and working, and, and that's very inhibiting and doesn't allow you to really do what you want to do. So I, I, I've been fortunate enough, and, I, and I've had some accidents, I might say, where, where my, I, I've misjudged people, and, and uh, the downfall of my first so-called large business uh, was misjudgment of a guy, not in his competence, but in his risk-taking. Now, how does one judge a person's ability or judgment? Now. I'm going to share with you something, but I don't want you to publish it. Okay. <laughs> How I, I will not employ a very senior person in my company unless he goes through a particular test. And that test, he is unaware of that he's actually being taken on that test. I ask him to take me for a drive. <laughs> and I watch the way he drives. And believe me, his very basic nature, if you travel around with him for two hours, you'll know everything about him. Is he overcautious? Does he take stupid risks? Is he in a hurry? <laughs> Is he a pusher? Is he a driver? It all comes out in that driving test, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only person who applies the, 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 the test but it works very well. And just think about it, and, and you'll see. You'll see a guy who's a great internal auditor, but not the leader of your team. you see a guy who's very reliable, but takes stupid risks. you, you you'll see a guy who doesn't take the opportunity because you're in a hurry, because he's too cautious. It all comes out in his personality. His personality comes out in the driving test. So there, that's something original, I think. I'm quite worried about whether anybody would employ me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the background. And what <laughs> job? And what <laughs> job? That's the question. Um, you've been doing business in a, the widest array of countries and political systems one could possibly imagine. What have been the essential differences for you to do business in South Africa under the regime then, in the United States, for that matter, in Israel and the countries more recently? All businesses is, is pretty well the same. It, it doesn't matter where you are. I have an instinct, <laughs> or w whatever it is. I, I see opportunity where, where many people may not. And uh, it, it's where I, I don't know that you can be trained for this. I, I, I just think it is just a natural talent that, that one has. And of course, as you get experience and as you gain experience, uh, you, you learn what, what works and what doesn't work. I say to everybody who works for me, don't worry about making mistakes. Because the biggest mistakes in, the, in our corporate history are made by me or were made by me. So if you're scared of making mistakes, you'll never achieve anything. So when you're not sure and you want to discuss anything with me, 
there's an open line and I'll give you my opinion. If you've made a mistake, don't hide it. Recognize it and fix it. Everybody will be happy with you, but if you hide it or, or justify it or, 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 or put it under the carpet, it's, it's really not, not a very smart thing to do. So when you make a mistake, just recognize it and fix it. If you had a business and you now had itchy feet and you now were looking at other ventures and you didn't have so much, too much cash but your business was worth a bit of capital, for other ventures, would you borrow money for the other ventures or would you sell your existing business and use that as capital for the next venture? You're painting with a very broad brush, and which ma makes it very difficult. But from my own experience, uh, that American business, which you saw, is a fantastic business. Uh, what I should have done, I should have borrowed money, <laughs> instead of which I sold 28 percent. 28 percent, one third of what I got went into the business, which helped it expand a bit, and the other two thirds allowed me to go to Australia and do other things. But I could have achieved exactly the same thing by borrowing money. And so uh, I, I got pulverized, uh, as you saw, <laughs> about uh, 25 years ago. And, and therefore, one becomes a little bit more cautious, makes sure you're not going to get pulverized a second time. <laughs> so uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because it, it depends on the circumstances, it depends on a, a, a wide variety of, of, of different criteria. Would you look to start ventures from, from nothing or would you rather look at existing ventures to buy, b businesses to buy into? I would strongly advise you just to look after your own business and make sure that it keeps growing and, and, and goes very well. Uh, hopping from one business to another is, is extremely difficult and uh, you need to have size in order to do a lot of things but if you're starting off, you, you don't need a great deal of capital because you've got your own human capital and you've got your own energy and your own resources that, 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 that flow. To hire quality people for small businesses is extremely difficult. So you, you can't attract quality people. So what we do when we have spare cash, we back an enormous number of, of people where they already have some kind of basis and they, and they need money for, for further expansion. So we, we very often do that. On the other hand, uh, I'm so conscious of what seed capital did for myself. That if I didn't have that 1,200 quid, that 1,200 pounds that I inherited from my father, I don't believe I could ever have started my business. So I actually have quite substantial charitable things where I provide seed money to people who want to start their own business. It's a complete non-for-profit operation. So I did in South Africa, Swaziland, Israel. I'm very conscious that, that you need seed money to start a business. So my own basic major charitable drive is towards helping people get on their own feet. In other words, fishing rods rather than fish. Uh, you mentioned before that you were worried about inflation. No, no, I'm not worried. I recognize it. You've recognized that inflation is going to be a problem. No, no, it's not a problem. It's a <laughs> inflation is a solution. Inflation is a solution to sovereign debt. Um, <laughs> and, and because you thought of as inflation as a solution, you thought that real estate was an excellent investment. Is, is that correct? Um, I, I, I don't think I know. Okay. Um, but, but, but of course. I'm, I'm also a lover of real estate. Um, and when I consider inflation, I consider that your costs of leveraging, your cost of finance go up with inflation, your operating expenses go up, and your rental generally stays fixed because of your, because of your operating income agreements, i.e. your rental agreements. What about investing in gold, which is inflation adjusted and gives you an excellent return? What, what do you think about gold going forward, especially in light of how it's how it's risen in value? With the exclusion of the last 12 months, it's one of the lousiest investments I know of. The exclusion of the last 12 months. And if you take a 30-year period, it's gone really nowhere. And let me just come back to your, your question on, on real estate. OK. Firstly, your rentals do go up pretty well everywhere. 
and they are inflation adjusted. Your cost of money can be fixed without any great difficulty. And your, you, uh, uh, typically, uh, you could buy, say, in Australia, and I just talked my own experience just very recently, bought some excellent real estate, got an 8% yield, cost of money was 5. Uh, so you had a, a, a gap of 3. I get it 2 to 1. So I made 6 on 8, gave me a 14% return. It has around about a 3% escalation because I've got a 2 to 1. It's a 9% escalation. So how far wrong can you go? Simple, really. Just find good tenants. That's the only thing. Gentlemen next door. How will the Curse Group thrive without you? With me, there's no job. Without me, there is a job. <laughs> And I have a, a good friend uh, whose name is very familiar to everybody in this room, and his name's Ron Sandler. And he is the, was brought in by the government to be the executive chairman of Northern Rock when, 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 when they went on the rocks. It's a pretty informal arrangement. He will step into my shoes if I fall over. I don't anticipate that anybody has to be a great entrepreneur because you're an entrepreneur when you handle your own money. When you're managing other people's money, you're careful and cautious. And so you, the one is preservation of capital, and the one is creation of capital. And uh, the Kirsch Group at this moment doesn't need another creator like me that will mess it up. So there we go. <laughs> is there anything in your business life that you regret? And if you could turn back time, is there anything you would do differently? Yeah, just generally speaking, there, there, there are lots of things that I would have done differently. And, and who knows, if I had done it differently, I might still be sitting in South Africa running a very large public company where I had a 6% economic interest but absolute control because it was pyramided from 6 to 12 to 25 to 50. Instead of having learned that lesson that public companies and having controlling structures where you don't have a economic interest that matches your responsibility uh, is not really a great idea. And so the only merit in, in public companies is it's a methodology of raising capital. And if you can avoid it, take some good advice, avoid being a public company if you can. <laughs> I would like to know what is your motivation to, when you wake up every day, what is your motivation to keep going and if it has changed through, throughout your, your life? I said it earlier, I'm having fun. Uh, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I enjoy what I do. I enjoy working with the people. And uh, a new opportunity that is interesting. There's a great similarity to what happened in South Africa to what has happened in China. In South Africa, you had apartheid taking all the white and Asian traders and turfing them out of the black areas, and you had this eruption of small traders that, that suddenly appeared. In China, you have the total disappearance of communism. If anybody tells you China is communist, forget it. <laughs> the only way thing that's still, that, that's still communist in China is how it's run. But everybody is told getting rich is very good and being very rich is even better. <laughs> <laughs> so what has happened in China is overnight millions of tiny storekeepers and tiny restaurants have just mushroomed up all over China and there is no supply chain. It is so crude and so unsophisticated that it is hard to believe. And the Chinese government recognized this, and, 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 and they are now trying to do something about it, and uh, hopefully I'm one of the tools that they're going to use. I just wanted to you know, ask you about the, the challenge of coming back. So that must have been a very difficult period. Um, and I wonder, you know, if you, did you have a vision of you know, changing Gentro or using that as a mechanism to change the whole industry so that they all play to your tunes? And if you, you, know, if you had done that, you know, how would you play it 
you know, step by step. Because because I guess that actually creates all your wealth, so that you can do all these other things. It was something to go to. It was not a thriving business at all, but it was. It had turned profitable. It had taken a long time. We opened our first one. We lost money for three years. In the fourth year, we made a bit of money. We thought, we've now got it right. So we opened three more warehouses very quickly. One in Philadelphia, another one in, in, in uh, Jersey, and another one in, in Brooklyn. And uh, suddenly, we were back losing money like crazy. And it took us years to understand that it wasn't us who had to learn how to run our business. It was our customer who had to change in order to take the benefits that he could get from our business. And today, in, in, in the major cities of, of, of America, we own that small store market. There, there's no competition because the small little wholesalers who used to deliver, they've disappeared. The big wholesalers deal with the big supermarkets. And, and the small guys, they, they just buy from us, and, and we're very effective and very efficient, and they get whatever they like, and so, so they do well and we do well. The cost of delivering to a small restaurant, so you've got a rep who takes the order, then you've got to pick the order, then you've got to put it in a frozen vehicle, then you've got to mm -hmm. deliver it, then you've got to give them credit, then you've got to collect the credit, <laughs> and, and the, each drop is very, very small. In our formula, <coughs> we have a warehouse, pictures of which you saw. About half of the warehouse is one very big fridge and part of it is a freezer. And the restaurant comes in and takes whatever he wants. So we're about 22% cheaper for the restaurant, which is a huge difference. So the cost of delivering small little bits and pieces and giving credit and picking and delivery and collecting the cash really uh, is, is, is changing the way food is done. So we're very, growing very rapidly uh, in the United States and we, we literally have no competition. Uh, one of the answers you gave to the other question, you should try and aim to be a leader in each of the markets you enter. But how do you go about doing that if you're entering a market that's particularly developed and you've got very experienced com you know, competitors in there already? You, you do it differently or you do it better? In, in, in a short answer. I think we've all seen an extremely <laughs> remarkable story by any standards. Um, and the sort of, the way it's been done, the number of times it's been done in so many different contexts. Of course I agree with you that business is the same all over the world. That is what, of course, what the London Business School is all about. Um, I'm not absolutely sure I agree with about the question of what can be learnt or taught, but of course we try and do our best here. Uh, but if, let me interrupt you. <laughs> The, <laughs> Have I the, got an the option? The best thing that ever happened to me that enabled me to do what I did was my commerce degree. Thank you very much. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's very, very clear. <laughs> <laughs> a cheque will be in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Nati, thank you very much indeed for coming. Really grateful. <laughs>